Hello, everyone, and welcome to CCP1's Demo Day. We're so excited to share this event here with you tonight. For those of you who are watching, please feel free to tag us on social media. So that's hashtag CC Demo Day and at Code Chrysalis. So what is going to happen tonight? Well, at first, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction and have some welcoming words. After that, we're going to have five amazing solo project presentations. Then we are going to have a senior project presentation and finally have some closing words. <clears throat> so before we jump into the solo project presentations, I wanna tell you a little bit about this cohort. So this is our inaugural cohort for the immersive part-time. There's a 25 week part-time program. The people that you are about to meet tonight are truly pioneers being the first cohort of this program. They have shown up every night for the past six months Monday and Friday, doing homework, watching lecture videos, working hard on sprints, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, straight after work for three hours every night for the past six months, and then all day on Saturday. They have juggled the commitment of this course through states of emergencies, full-time jobs, cross countries, and in one case, an international move, and social upheaval. So I wanted you to have that context for the wonderful people that you're going to meet tonight. So the first project that we have is solo projects. And these are going to be individual projects by each one of the students. And each of the projects that you will see tonight will have been completed at various parts of the course. So up first, we have our solo MVP project presentations. And the next two students you are gonna see completed these projects two months ago, approximately at the end of July. And students had only one week to build a working MVP. So we hope you enjoy their presentations. Up first is Yukari. I'm gonna ask her to come on stage. Okay, hello Yukari, are you ready to go? Yeah, hi everyone, I wanna share my screen. And while Yukari gets her screen shared, I actually want to note here that her project is a combination of the solo API and polyglottal project. So we actually asked her to start first. So Yukari, are you ready to go? Yes. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Today, I'd like to introduce my solo API and the polyglottal project app. This is Project Translator. And what is Rosetta Translator? So it's text translator web app using machine translate APIs. To compare original text and translate to one as, uh, like as Rosetta Stone, it is helpful not only to get other language information, but also to get uh, to learn uh, foreign language. So that's why through this project, I could. I created this app. First, I wanna show my web my web app demo. Yeah, this is my uh, web Rosetta Translate app. When user enter the left box in this in this box, and after translated to that, user can get two type of APIs result. Middle box shows uh, DeepL API result and Google uh, Translate API result show uh, on the left, uh, right side box. So I'd like to test this. Uh, this is uh, our immersive part-time uh, courses uh, introduced page. So, oh, I'd like to check this sentence me. Uh, copy and paste. So this and the translate. Oh, Google Translate API return their result so quickly. However, I think DeepL API result uh, result is more uh, high quality rather than Google uh, Translate. Yeah, that's my uh, web app demo. So this this project I. I used to add tech stack, uh, those, those, those technologies. As a translated API, I used uh, two type of translated API, uh, 
first Google L Translate API and second I used Google uh, Google Translate to API and uh, as front end Java I used JavaScript and React framework and uh, to learn different programming language I used to go back end second uh, I wanna introduce what I learned this project. And I, I learned three things from this project. First, practical API usage. Uh, for example, deep, uh, how, can, how can I use uh, a practical API like DeepL or Google Cloud API? Yukari, we're yeah. gonna refresh something on the stream. So can you pause for just a second? Oh, Sorry. we have, we're having. Uh, I'd like to introduce this web app tech stack. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I used to, as a translator API, uh, I used two API, first, DeepL API Translate, and second, Google Cloud Translate API. And for front end, I used JavaScript and React framework. However, to run other, uh, other different, to lang programming language. As a backend, I used the Go language. Next, uh, what I'd like to introduce what I learned from this project. I learned three things. First, uh, practical API usage. So for example, how can I use practical API like DeepL or Google Cloud API? Through this project, I learned this thing. And second, full stack API from scratch to setting and integrate different web app like JavaScript to the front end and goes back end. It's so helpful experience for me. And finally, different programming language style like JavaScript and Go to learn these things also it's important experience for me. So finally, I'd like to share about what is the challenge in this project. Uh, I have uh, two, uh, two challenges. First, cross-origin resource sharing. Probably many developers encounter this issues. Even uh, me, I heard this term. However, I did not uh, truly understand this meaning. And uh, in, uh, 
the, during this project, I encountered this problem and uh, to solve this issue, I needed to understand the truly meaning. So uh, it's important experience. And the second, go unique syntax. Uh, for example, multiple return value or value declare or only uh, go has only four loops. When I, as, uh, I was a university student, I learned C language. And after that, I also learned uh, some object oriented lang language like Java or C sharp. However, Go has a uh, unique syntax like this. And in especially, how can I use this as object oriented language? I was very confused. And even Go official homepage also say, is Go an object oriented language? Yes and no. It is uh, so interesting thing. Yeah, so through this project, I learned those things. That's it. Thank you for uh, watching my presentation. Awesome presentation, Yukari. Thank you so much. And I really like that we have two different versions of the translated text. Sometimes nuance really, really matters. So we're going to say goodbye to Yukari for now until we welcome her in the final presentation. And up next, we have Ko presenting his version of Minesweeper. It's his adaptation of the classic. So can't wait for all of you to see that. So Ko, could you please go ahead and come up? Hello. Hello. Are you ready to present? Yes. Beautiful. Take it away. Hey. Uh, hi, my name is Ko. And for my solo MVP project during my time at Ko Chrysalis, I made Minesweeper. So why did I make Minesweeper? Well, um, I only had a week to work on this project. And Minesweeper itself, isn't a very complex game. Um, the rules are very straightforward. And so I thought I could make this in a week. And then more importantly, I like to play it myself. I don't play it every single day, but I play a couple of games like every now and then. And so why not build something that I like to play myself? So as I mentioned, uh, for this one week, I wanted to build a working game. So. I could quickly show you what I was able to make in this one week. So this is my Minesweeper that is deployed onto Heroku. I have three levels. So I have a beginner level, which has 10 mines. I have an intermediate level, which has 40 mines. And then I have an expert level that has 99 mines. And it also has a timer so that once you start your left click on a cell, uh, the counter will start. So if I do that, the timer starts. And then it says one here, which means I have one mine surrounding this one cell here. Uh, let me just click around here. OK, so I got to a point where I actually clicked on a cell that had no mine surrounding it. So what it did was it continued to open the surrounding cells until the outermost uh, like open block had either has either one mine touching it or it reached the end of the block or like end of the board like this year. So this is again, isn't a very like, this is a very typical um, feature in Minesweeper and I was able to replicate it. Um, and then let me actually switch over to an intermediate board really quickly. Um, if I do a right click, what it's going to do is it is going to actually plant a flag. Uh, which indicates that you think that this is where a mine is. And you can also see that the mine counter here is decreasing whenever I plant one. And then it will obviously increase when I uh, undo that. Um, and then let me try to make a mistake here. Yeah. So if I do click on a mine, uh, left click on a mine, then it, uh, it reveals that uh, in red so that it knows that you made a mistake here. It also reveals all the other mines that, uh, that were planted on the board. And then these icons here, are cells that you actually uh, planted a flag, but they're actually incorrect. So you can also like double check your work this way. 
Um, and then that's pretty much it for my Minesweeper. Towards the bottom here, I do have like a leaderboard so that um, if you do complete a board, uh, you get you get a pop-up that says if you want to save your score or not. And if you do choose to save your score, then you can see how you did against other players. So this is my Minesweeper that I made. In terms of my tech stack that I used, for the front end, I use React with Bootstrap. For the back end, I use Express.js and TypeScript with Prisma. For the database, I use Postgres. And for my deployment, I deployed both my front end and my back end in Heroku. So some of the challenges that I faced um, in terms of like time management, as I mentioned earlier, this project was a week long. So, and I had to build both the front end and the back end, which means I had to manage my time uh, pretty well or else uh, I couldn't finish both. both. And then because, this, because what I was making Minesweeper, I did wanna focus a little bit more on the front end. And so I had to schedule my time accordingly. And then related to that, for my backend, originally I actually wanted to use CockroachDB with SQLize ORM just because I've used Prisma and Postgres in a different Code Chrysalis project. However, I couldn't get my local environment to run with uh, CockroachDB and SQLize ORM. And, uh, and because I wanted to focus more on the front end, I decided to pivot to a technology that I've used before and I knew worked. But if I had more time, I would have definitely loved to use a new technology so that I could get a feel of what it's like to use those. Some of my learning experiences, um, something cool that I learned was uh, I got to apply the breadth first search algorithm that we learned in class in this Minesweeper game. So when I was demoing the, the part where I was clicking on a cell and if that cell had no mind surrounding it, it continued to open the surrounding cells until it got to the point where the outermost had at least one mine touching it or it reached the side of the board. So in order to do that, I had to use this breadth first search algorithm. And yeah, I just found it really nice to be able to actually apply something that we learned in class in a real life game. And then my second point I learned was, I mean, it wasn't a big surprise, but the basic Minesweeper game is a relatively simple game. And so if I really wanted to differentiate my Minesweeper, like, against the ones that are already out in the public, I'll probably need to add like more functionalities that aren't in typical Minesweeper games or like make the UI or the effects uh, different to really stand out. And then some of my future plans I have, uh, my current version of the Minesweeper is more for desktop. And so I do wanna make it mobile friendly. Um, so I haven't, like, uh, being able to create custom boards is something a typical Minesweeper game can do, but I didn't have the time to implement, so probably doing something that like that as well. Um, I do like to keep, like, I do like to know my statistics for games, so, like, something like click counts or clicks per second is something I want to add. And then probably just adding logins for, so users can actually, like, save their records and statistics. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. If you want to see my code that I used, uh, you can scan the QR code. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Ko. That's a very impressive MVP. And I think games have kind of shepherded us through some pretty dark times recently. So it's great to see yours and uh, look forward to the future development of that as well. So we'll say goodbye to you as well until the end of our show tonight. And up next, we are going to move to our polyglottal portion of the presentation this evening. So for those of you who are not former students or are not familiar with the Code Crystals community, uh, curriculum. Polyglottal is a presentation or a, a project where students have just two weeks, again, you know, they're, they're only nights and weekends for this class, to create a full stack app from scratch in, to a working MVP level in a new or relatively unfamiliar language. So a tall order. Um, this was completed one and a half months ago in the immersive full-time course, which is again, or part-time course, excuse me, which is again, 25 weeks long. And so the next two students are going to be showcasing the projects that they completed during that time. 
So up first, we have Connell. He's going to be showing us his app bookshelf. And this is basically an app to help optimize your bookmark experience. And I will turn it over to him to explain a little bit more. So Connell, are you ready to come up? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. OK, so I'll turn it over to you. OK. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Connell, and I'll be introducing my polyglottal project bookshelf written in Rust and Python. The project goals for this polyglottal project were to learn a completely new programming language from scratch, to make a project using the new language, and the time limit for it was two weeks, as Heather just mentioned. My personal goals, however, were to make something useful, something that I would want to use after the Code Chrysalis course had ended, and I wanted to challenge myself, which I did by trying to learn two new languages. So as a whirlwind introduction, Rust is a low-level, compiled, statically typed language, usually used for systems programming. And Python is a dynamic, high-level language that's interpreted. So very different languages. So it was really interesting to compare and contrast them. As Heather mentioned before, my project was to make a smart bookmarking application user utilizing the browser's custom search engines. Now, people might be unfamiliar with those, so I'll show you my demo. So let's take a look at that. So first is the CLI application that I created during in Rust. So let's start this off. So do I want to sign up? Yes, let's sign up. So what will I want my username to be? Let's try CCP1. Yes, great. Put Chrysalis username there. Uh, let's input a password. Let's go for one, two, three, four, five. I would not recommend using this password in real life there. Okay, so we'll press enter and it looks like the signup has been successful. That's great. So let's add some commands. This time I do not want to sign up again, but do I want to add a new bookmark? Yes, I do. So first let's input my username again, CCP1 and my password one, two, three, four, five. For security reasons, obviously I wouldn't want to show my password later on, but as this was made during two weeks, I couldn't help that fact, unfortunately. So let's input a bookmark. Uh, in CCP, we go to GitHub a lot. So let's try that. So ghwww.github.com. Okay, let's save that bookmark. Great. So let's go to the browser and let's use this bookmark. So here I am in Chrome. So first, to utilize the, the custom search engines in the browser, we need to give the browser a command. So for this, I've set shelf as the, as the command. This tells the browser we want to use the bookshelf uh, custom search engine. So after doing that, you can see it says search bookshelf. Let's try GH for GitHub. So that brings me to GitHub, as you can see. You can create many, many different uh, bookmarks. So here's one I made earlier, GHCC. So this should take me to the Code Chrysalis GitHub. So as you can see from this, it's very easy to set up and it will save you a lot of time going to many different um, websites. You don't have to remember URLs. However, if you make a mistake and say, let's try shelf FB, I haven't actually set up a, a bookmark for this, but if I try shelf FB, then I, instead I'll be redirected to a Google search using um, with FB in the search. So that's a, we'll make it so that you don't have to remember all your bookmarks off the top of your head. So that was my application bookshelf. So as you can see how it works, the kind of overall flow. First, we sign up with the CLI and add commands. Next, we set up the custom search engine in the browser. And then this search engine connects to the bookshelf server so we can access our commands. For my tech stack, I had a CLI written in Rust, as I mentioned. I have a server written in Python using the Flask framework and deployed onto Heroku. And my database was MongoDB Atlas, which is on a Google Cloud platform. For future features, I would like to improve security, as I mentioned before. If I had more users, that would be a very high priority. 
I would also like to upgrade servers. Currently, they're on the free Heroku server, and you might have mentioned you might have noticed a bit of delay there. Finally, improve the UI and UX. Not everyone is comfortable working with the command line, so I would really like to improve that that feature. I had started a, a desktop GUI app using React and the Tori framework, which utilizes JavaScript and Rust. But uh, in the two weeks, I didn't have enough time to pull everything off. So yeah, I'll be working on that in the future. For the challenges that I faced during this project was, as I mentioned just now, taking on too much. We only had two weeks. I learned two new languages and a lot of new frameworks. So that was a big, a tall order, I would say. And finally, uh, Rust is fun, but it's complex. There's a lot of memory management that you have to do. And it's really, uh, it takes a lot of time to learn. So maybe not a great choice for a two week project, but really interesting and a great challenge, I think. In summary for this project, I bit off slightly more than I could chew, but it was a really great experience. And I would recommend to anyone trying Rust and Python as they're both really fun to work with. Thank you for listening. You can find my personal GitHub on the left QR code, and on the right is the QR code for my bookshelf uh, GitHub page, which where you can find instructions on how to get started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connell. Thank you for sharing your project with us. Thank you. And I think small optimizations really matter over the long term. So. Thank you for sharing this and look forward to seeing how this develops in the future as well. So we will also say goodbye to you for now. See you again later when we get the backgrounds explained. I'm excited about that. And our next presentation is going to be Curtis and he's going to be telling us about triangles. I'm just gonna leave that mystery right there for Curtis to explain because he does it way better than I could. And so Curtis, are you ready to take it over? I am. Thank you, Heather. I'll okay. share my screen. And so today I'll be talking about C++ and OpenGL, also known as triangles. Now, why did I choose C++? Through Cold Curseless, we've always been using JavaScript and occasionally TypeScript. However, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to try a lower level language. For those who don't know, a lower level language the language is closer to the machine code. You know how we think of computers talking in zeros and ones? Well, C++ would be closer to that compared to JavaScript. JavaScript would be considered much more of a higher level language. Additionally, C++ also has memory management. I'd have to manage how big my variables would be, for example. That's much different from JavaScript. Now, a brief history of C++. C++ is a iteration of C. It is C with classes created by Bjorn Straustrup. It's called C++ because plus plus is an iterator and he intended it to be the iteration of C. As a result, it does inherit the syntax from C. It's a multi-paradigm static normal type system and it's compiled, which means you have to run a compiler, which then you can execute. Now down below here, I have the standard console log or the print of hello world, which is usually the first type of program that you learn when you learn, when you learn a programming language. It's significantly longer than that of JavaScript. Now I learned quite a bit from C++. C++ took me my first week of polyglottal. I learned there's a lot of things about memory allocations for types. There's different sizes for floats, unsigned versus signed integers. Um, what's the difference between a floating value versus a integer? I also learned that there's no native garbage collecting in C++. Native garbage collecting means that once you stop using it, some sort of data value, it cleans up the memory. However, C++ doesn't have that. I also learned in C++ there's no nested functions, meaning I can't put a function inside another function. This is really common in JavaScript. So C++ was, was not allowed to do that. I also came across many errors. Now, people have always talked about these horror stories with C++ and compilation errors. And I think that the, the terminal has gotten a lot better, giving better feedback. And it wasn't, I didn't find it as difficult. That being said, I still had plenty of compilation errors. 
usually my own bad code for getting semicolons, and some that I still have no idea to this very day. Now, OpenGL. OpenGL is the graphics portion of my polyglottal the second week. OpenGL is a cross-platform, which means it works on OS X, Windows, and Linux. The cross-language application, so I can use different languages. I chose C++ as an application programming interface. It's how you communicate with the computer. Now, OpenGL only does graphics. Contrast this with DirectX, which does all types of other media, like video. Some OpenGL examples is really common in video games, especially ones that are multi-platform. Um, those examples here are Hades, which is an indie darling. And the bottom is Counter-Strike 1.6, a true classic. Now, before we use OpenGL, I had to use some extensions. The first one would be GLEW, the OpenGL Extension Wrangler Library. I had to use this because, well, Windows actually has um, DirectX. And as a result, they didn't feel the need to actually update OpenGL past 1.0. And OpenGL 1.0 is full of bugs and all these very strange things. So if I wanted to use OpenGL 3.0 or 4.0, I'd have to use Clue. Now, I also wanted to render my graphics onto a window. And I had to use GLFW, which is the graphics library framework. This is a small library which allows me to create a window to render my images. I also used Microsoft's Visual Studio, and this allowed for project file configurations and dependency management. Now, I'm going to talk about shaders. Now, a shader has nothing to do with shading. It actually is just a program that you send to the graphics card. Now, before we make any sort of image, we must create a vertex shader. A vertex shader are the points of the shape that we'll be making. As you can see, we first create the three points we will create the shape assembly, which will connect those. And then we need to figure out what to do from here. And that's where a fragment shader comes into hand. A fragment shader tells you what to do between all of those three points you just made. There's some rasterization, which means it turns it into a pixel. And then your monitor will then render it on the screen for you to see. Now, what about polygons? The thing about making it any sort of polygon, they're actually all triangles. As you can see, we have a rectangle over there. It's actually two triangles. What about a pentagon? It's actually three triangles. But why triangles? Well, the idea is that a triangle is always coplanar, which means it's always going to make a flat surface. Now, if you didn't use something that was coplanar, like say making a square, but one of them was in a separate plane, you get all these rendering issues, and you just get a whole mess that you're looking at. Additionally, all polygons can be broken down to triangles, as I mentioned. And also, memory can be really efficient in things like triangle strips and triangle fans. The end result, after 220 lines of code, was this pentagon. And I believe it is quite a beautiful pentagon. As you can see, it is actually made of three triangles. That top part is one triangle. There's one that extends from the purple to the yellow to the white. And there's one that extends from the purple to the white to the blue. Now, another thing I didn't mention, but actually I also had to use trigonometry to calculate these points, mainly because this is on an XY plane. All right, well, thank you so much. If you'd like to see my code, you can actually scan this QR code. Um, my Twitter is Curtis A. Huang, and as is my GitHub. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Curtis. Through going through the presentation pre preparation with you on this, I think I will never look at my monitor the same way again. <laughs> so thank you for uh, calling us all to question our reality and whether or not it is in fact made up of triangles. So well done. And we'll say goodbye to you as well for now. And then our final solo presentation of the evening is actually going to be from a throwback to the beginning of the course, way back in April, when students have to learn about a sorting algorithm and create a really cool visualization to help teach their classmates about them. And so wrapping up the solo presentation part of the evening is going to be Daichi. He's going to be presenting us with his visualization for bubble sort 
and we just thought it was too cool not to show here tonight. So Daichi, please come on up. Hello. Hi. Hello Daichi, are you ready? Yep. Okay, take it away. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Daichi and I would like to show my 13 algorithm visualization project about the uh, bubble sword. So what is bubble sort? The bubble sort is a comparison based algorithm, sorting algorithm, and first references, referenced as sorting by exchange originally back in 1956. And the term bubble sort was first used by Kenneth E. Iverson, who was a Canadian software engineer in 1962. And this algorithm got its name because elements tend to move up into the correct order like bubbles rising to the surface as you can see in the image below and alternatively called the sinking sword that will be the other way. Okay, so now that we had a brief intro about the bubble sword, let me show you a short demo of the visualization. Okay, so here we have my demo and so some features it has, so adding numbers to the array we have here, individually at random arrays, cleared array, and stars audience. So for the demo, let's add random, um, random array, let's say an array of 10 elements. Cool, now that we have this unsorted array, let's start sorting this. And by the way, I decided, to, I chose a game, Pokemon uh, theme to make it fun and interactive to learn about this algorithm. As you can see, we have the, the traditional Pokemon game tool here. You can select some of them, you can run away. Well, let's fight this on sword array. Oh, it seems like if we have no bubble sword, well, let's use that. So, As you can see, bubble so we will start taking each one. Oh, sorry. sorry about that. Um, okay. As, as I talk about in the intro, it will take it compare, start comparing each element and start comparing with the adjacent element and check if it's higher and start swapping and moving and start sorting and moving the element, the number in the correct order, as you can see. Um, so since, um, this um, algorithm will look through each element and see like for la large collections of numbers will take a lot of time. You can see too long that EV fell asleep. But, but there you go, we have a unsorted array and EV is wake up again. So that was the demo. So I'll, now I'd like to talk about, about the implementation of this algorithm. The implementation is really simple. Um, uh, it will take uh, the array of numbers and loop nest uh, loops and start looping through, take the first index. And so I was showing the demo, it will compare here, if it's higher, we'll start swapping until it has this correct order and it's sorted. So what's the time complexity for this algorithm? So for the best case for this will be O of N, a linear, but that will be the case when the array is like almost already 
sorted or close. But usually it will be like the worst case, which is will be the O of N squared quadratic. So um, let me show you the graph to make it easier to understand. So uh, same linear, you can see EV here. We'll start scaling in the direct proportion of the input size. But uh, let's see mm, for the time complexity, the worst case will be quadratic. So we'll start performing uh, poorly really quick if the when the input size increases, as you can see here, will take more time. So next, I uh, will be uh, like to talk about um, the pros and cons of this algorithm. Uh, some pros of it is that it's really simple algorithm implementation, as you saw in the slides. Uh, it's really simple. It's really to understand, and obviously, it will take lines of code uh, the other way uh, the cons will be that will be the performance will be poor for large collections okay so some challenges for this project was uh, mainly just the demo the visualization part uh, manipulating the DOM uh, was a little bit harder than I expected and also I didn't use a library I it was built with vanilla JavaScript and plain CSS in HTML. But I think it was good to understand better though and review the basics of everything. Also the dialogue timing for the gaming theme was a little bit of a challenge. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening and hope you enjoy a learn up a little bit more about bubble sort and know that sometimes it's fun to learn about algorithms if you use Pokemon. So there, here are my GitHub and some, if you want to contact me, there are some track codes. Thank you. Awesome, Daiichi. Thank you for that really fun presentation. Um, and if he, he kind of went through it really quickly, but if the, those of you didn't catch the pun towards the very end of his presentation, uh, you have to go back and watch the stream again and get it and then contact Daiichi and laugh with him about it. So Daiichi, thank you very much. We're going to say goodbye to you just for a moment. Um, so that's going to wrap up our solo portion of tonight's event. And without further ado, we are going to move on to the senior project and wrap things up. So just to share a little bit about the senior project, uh, students started up on this about five weeks ago. And since then, I think they'll probably all agree behind their cameras right now that this is when things got real. Uh, things became very intense and they worked very, very hard to create from scratch. So from zero, no idea, nothing like that. Uh, the app that you are about to see here tonight. Um, so we're going to welcome Team Ice Cream to the stage and they are going to be presenting their app My Niwa, which is going to help you cultivate a better life. So we'll leave it to them. Team Ice Cream, are you ready to go? Yep, we're ready. Okay, give it up for Team Ice Cream. Hey, so hello everyone again. Um, I'm Daichi and I would like to show you our senior project, my new one. Uh, before starting, I would like to introduce the team. So again, I'm Daichi. I was the tech lead for this project and I was in charge of test management and be sure that everything is working. And I'm Yukari. I mainly developed the manuals back end. Hi, I'm Ko and I was full stack, but primarily working on the back end. I'm Curtis. I did mostly front end um, with a focus on UI and UX. And I'm Connell. And I was mainly working on the front end for my new app. First, I'd like to introduce some of the problems that our app will be addressing. 
Have you ever struggled to change your habits or to maintain a new habit? Do you find it difficult to track your progress? We'll hope that with our app, we can solve some of these problems. So let's look at our solution. Our solution is broken down into three parts. First, we want to have a way for the user to start a new habit, to create a custom one that's based on their life. Second, we want to record the results, track the user's progress across each of their new habits and across time. Finally, we wanted to show the user progress and provide feedback for them so that they could stay motivated while try to, trying to cultivate their new habits. Next, I'll pass to Daichi, who's going to talk about Juanita. Thank you, Colonel. Um, yes, I'd like to talk about Juanita. But first, uh, she's our persona. So what's a, first, what's a persona? So persona is a fictitious person created to identify the needs of the target user for our app. So Juanita, she is a um, 27 years old single and has a really cute cut called ice cream, as you can see here and down in the bottom. So cute that we decided to name us our team, Ice Cream. So what her, her needs are, uh, she wants to change her habits and become more of a morning person and use and manage her time better and improve her lifestyle. So next, I'd like to pass it over to Curtis, who is going to walk you through the app in a really short demo. All right, thank you, Daichi. So I will be guiding us through the demo today. Well, when you first open the app, you reach our splash page here. Our splash page here, as you can see, it has my Niwa, our logo on top, and it has the large kanji for Niwa right in the middle. We chose Niwa because it's a, it's a garden or a courtyard, but not like a grand one, a small one, a modest one, one that you might have inside your own home. And it's something that is personal, it is your Niwa. Um, additionally, a garden may have flowers that will grow, much like hopefully yourself after using our app. But let's say you came here and you didn't know what was going on. We could click on what is my Niwa, and we can learn a bit more about what, what my Niwa is about. Ah, as you can see here, we have, we're talking about growing a beautiful garden. Our first step is to create a flower bed with seeds, which are good habits that you'd like to have. Our second step is to do your daily gardening, which is to maintain your habits in order to gain coins. The third step is to use these coins to buy flowers. And the fourth step is to collect all the flowers while bettering yourself. Now, of course, we need to have users. So when you come to this page, you can sign in with Google. We use Firebase authentication to create a sign in with Google. You can also add Facebook and Twitter and other types of authentication techniques. But we're going to use Google today. And we're going to sign in with our ice cream account. Now, once we sign in, we'll be led to our flower bed page. The flower beds page right here has all of our different habits and groups that we've created. For example, let's say, let's look at healthy life. We can click on that one and we can see some things that we've had. Ah, this is our daily gardening. We can see we can wake up at 7 a.m. We can eat a healthy breakfast before 10 a.m. and we can eat dinner. Now, let's say we want to actually make one of these. Let's go back to flower beds. Let's create a new one. Ah, so let's press the little plus button. Now, if you didn't have any flower beds, there actually be a notice that tell you to click on the plus button. Let's create one. Let's create one for ice cream, actually. So we can name this flower bed ice cream. I think that's a pretty good name. And ice cream, he's a great cat. So we can add description. This is purely optional, but I'd like to add a little color. Let's add maybe best cat. He is the best cat. Now, the thing about ice cream is that I think ice cream, mm, he's been eating a little bit too much. So we might want to bring him back down to a slightly healthier diet. So maybe we can select the category of health. Let's click on health and set that as our category and go to the next page. Ah, as you can see, we now get to plant our seeds. Hmm, let's see, Daichi, you got any ideas? What would be a good seed to plant? Yeah, what about taking for a walk? A walk? Oh, a walk, 
<laughs> yeah, let's take ice cream off for a walk. So walk the cat. That's a that's a very cute idea. I've always been a fan of walking cats. I'm not sure if all the cats are a fan of it, but let's walk ice cream. Let's plant that seed. Hmm. Let's add another seed. Uh, Ko, you got any ideas? Um, what about like a uh, one treat a day? Oh, okay. How strict. Let's uh, <laughs> let's give ice cream only one treat a day. Um, now, I mean, ice cream might not be too happy with this, but you know, it's for his own good, I think. One, only one treat, and let's plant that. All right, now that we have two seeds, we have walked the cat and only one treat a day. Let's go to our next page. This will bring us to the summary page where we actually have the name of our flower bed, description, category, and our seeds. Let's add our flower bed. We click on the add flower bed. And this will bring us to our daily gardening page for this flower bed. All right, let's say we did take ice cream out for a nice walk to the amusement of our neighbors. All right, we'll click on that, we get a nice loading flower, and we see a tick mark. As you can see, actually, our coins went up. Um, now, actually, one treat a day, that seems a little strict. I think ice cream's been a pretty good cat. Let's, let's change our rules. Let's go to edit garden and change that. All right, let's scroll down and let's see. Oh, one treat a day. I think it's been pretty good. Let's move that to maybe three treats a day. You know, he just gets that, that forlorn look. You know, you just have to give him a couple more treats. Let's update that. Three treats a day. He deserves it. He's been a good cat. All right, let's go back to our daily gardening. Uh, look, by the way, I'll point out 62 coins. Let's check off, check off three treats a day. Uh, 63 coins. Now we have plenty of coins. What are we going to do with so many coins? Let's head over to the florist to see what we can do. Ah, uh, you can see we have lots of flowers here. Check out that beautiful pixel art. We're going to actually buy some flowers here. We can scroll up and down and we can see lots of mysterious flowers that we don't know. They're all, we have to unlock them. Let's buy, hmm, that thing, there's, there's a coin for 20 coins. What's that? Ooh, are you the dragon food or something? Let's let's buy this. Yes, please. Oh, it's a peony. What a beautiful flower. And you see our coin total went down. Now, just looking at on the flower page, this isn't quite that much. But we do have, thankfully, a My Neewa page. And this is where we can see all the flowers that we have purchased. You can see we have our nice little garden by the, by the ocean, the nice breeze, and all of the flowers that we have purchased. And in the sky, you may see some birds. You can see some nice little animations of birds flying through the nice clear sky. Now, of course, as always, if you're doing some, you're using one of these apps, you do want to see a history of things. So we do have included a My Growth tab. This will actually show you a historical recording of what we've, what our performance for the past week or month. As you can see over here, this week's seed, we have a check mark. This actually shows us each of the individual seeds that we have done for the week. Looks like this user has been doing pretty well. There's plenty of check marks there. We scroll down a little bit more. We do have a heat map. Ah, look at that. The heat map, the darker the color, the more seeds that you performed for that day. Great job. Looks like they're heating up. Now, if we click on a little hamburger icon, we can actually export this. We can actually download as an SVG, a PNG, or a CSV. And after this, you probably want to log out. We can click on the nice icon in the top right, and we can log out. And that concludes our demo for MyNiwa. Now I'll pass it on to Ko. We'll talk about our tech stack. Thank you very much, Curtis. So let me explain the tech stack that we use to build MyNiwa. On the front end, we used React with TypeScript. We use Material UI for our UI library and Recoil for our state management. All of this was deployed onto Netlify. And as Curtis mentioned during his demo, uh, for the authentication, we used Firebase authentication. The backend is a REST API built on Golang. It is containerized using Docker. And this is deployed onto GCP. And then finally, we used MongoDB for our database. Uh, Daichi, can you go to the next slide, please? 
the next slide is, this is about the challenges that we faced. So for the front end, uh, we had a bit of a challenge just integrating the various technologies together. So each of the individual technologies had great documentations. However, there weren't too many like examples of like an app that had everything together. Um, and on top of that, we were using TypeScript, which made it a little bit more complex. So the front end team had to do a lot of research, um, trial and error to piece all these things together. For the back end, we actually had server performance issues early on. So we noticed that the response time from the back end was extremely slow at the beginning. And after some investigation, we found that the root cause was probably to do with Heroku's free servers. And so that's why we actually moved our infrastructure to GCP. And then finally, just connecting our front end and back end together. Um, the first week of development, our teams were uh, pretty siloed. And so there was a mismatch between what the front end team was expecting versus what the back end team thought the front end team was expecting. And so we had to, we had to talk things out. We have to talk it out. Uh, we have to put more documentations in place. And once we were to be able to do that, then uh, we were able to like connect our front end and back end uh, smoothly. So now I'll pass it over to Yukari, who will be talking a little bit about our learnings and future features. Thank you, Ko. Now I'd like to explain, uh, explain what we learned from this project. First, management for a large project. We are part-time immersive student. While we have, uh, we have to work in their daytime, we still need to develop our apps. With our limited time, we should manage our project like, uh, how exactly do we write code until next meeting? What future can we develop? Or we can, when we can discuss software requirement to solve those issues, we try to use tools like Slack, Notion, GitHub project tools, and Kanban. Through this experience, we learned how to effectively communicate so, uh, or how to develop in parallel and how to manage uh, our schedule. Second, pick up new technologies in a short amount of time. Actually, in a short time, we, need to, we needed to, to, to find to learn new technologies. For example, as Ko mentioned, we had to encounter the uh, server performance issue. To solve this, we needed to, to change tech stack so quickly. Through this experience, we learned to pick up new technologies in a short amount of time. Yeah. Next slide, please. As future features, we are considering implement these features. First, to, to keep good habits, social features are effective. So we are considering futures like growing flower beds as a group, following flowers, uh, friends, or uh, implement leaderboards. Next, we'd like to provide a template flower bed for our users. Templates can be useful as inspiration in case a user has trouble coming up with good habits. This may help a user improve their live in ways they did not think of. Finally, we provide only a web app. Uh, however, to become more convenient, we would like to prepare a native mobile app or a progressive web app. We have a basic implement of a prog uh, progressive web app, but could provide additional uh, functionality like uh, push notifications. Yeah, that's our project. Thank you for uh, watching our presentation. If you are interested in our code, our code or our contact address, please check this QR code. Okay, thank you very much, Team Ice Cream. So if everyone watching could give another hand for CCP1, yes. Okay.
It's way more exciting uh, here by myself in my room than it probably looks online. <laughs> so, uh, you know, their app that they presented at the end of it is truly fantastic. Growth happens in small spurts. So we love the idea of seeds and watching things grow over time. Indeed, as we have watched these fledgling software engineers uh, become full stack software engineers and more experienced engineers over the past six months. So we're really proud of them. Uh, I think everyone watching can agree with me that they are an extremely resilient, gritty, collaborative, kind, and hardworking bunch of individuals. So uh, please take my advice and hire them right away. So that'll be it for our presentations tonight. So just to let you know some upcoming events, Oh, sorry about this. Okay, so uh, our next immersive full-time program is going to start in November. The suggested deadline for that has already passed. You have a little bit of time before the final deadline. So if those of you are thinking about applying, get cracking. And so our next immersive part-time cohort starts in January. Uh, the suggested deadline is in November and the final deadline is in December. If you were as impressed as we were with the results of our inaugural cohort, we highly, highly encourage you to sign up for the next program. And finally, uh, if you're watching this and you're new to coding and it looks like magic to you, it isn't. So get started with our foundations program and we have a lot of programs coming up for that. And so finally, of course, in addition to thanking CCP1 for being such awesome pioneers and writing this first journey with us with full trust and just such equanimity, I also wanna thank our community as usual. Um, we can do it without you. Uh, we love you and we are deeply grateful to you. And we hope that all of you stay healthy, stay safe and keep in touch. And that's gonna be all. Good night, everyone.